Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. So affordable housing. Now for uh, I need to work, so I need to go back and forth to Athens, and I was looking for an apartment. And I was looking for an apartment close to my work, so I don't need to you know, spend one hour and a, and a half in the, in the subway. This was not possible. It was like 800 euros for something close to being decent. And the other option was to go further away and then spend almost one hour and a half in my car, CO2 emissions and traffic all the time and trying to work with your phone and that you have like multiple car accidents while trying to combine driving with working. And I could see how this problem actually starts the last five, six years, I think, has been maybe more becoming one of the biggest problems uh, in, the, in Europe, especially for, uh, for young people. And I have with me all the right, uh, the right professionals to talk about it. So first I will, I will begin with Diana Jordanova. You're the Housing Europe Communications Director. And could you give us like a wider image of the situation in Europe and how did we reach this point? How did we reach that point? Um, Unfortunately, it started quite a long time ago, <laughs> but um, specifically after the, 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 the last financial crisis, um, but also already before COVID, uh, we were raising awareness a lot about what is happening. And then, and then we saw just, I saw a publication of, of Bo Stiftung, Perma crisis, COVID, energy crisis, inflation crisis, social unrest, wars, it's just, incredible to think and each time this was um, always impacting the most vulnerable first um, and on the other hand we could say that there was massive attention to housing um, which in one hand was good because uh, for instance I was mentioning yesterday in Brussels uh, when the main order was stay at home, we realized that we had uh, homeless people on the streets. So in Brussels, they had um, um, a document that they could show that the proof that they are allowed to stay uh, on the street because they have nowhere to go. So the attention came and, and it came to Housing Europe. Um, just to mention, we, we represent uh, so public, cooperative and social housing providers, very diverse, but always with the same mission to provide affordable and decent housing to people. Um, and then the, a lot of attention came. We saw some, some stimulus um, and, and the realizations like, oh wow, housing is important and not, people don't live decently. Um, but the problem that we have been seeing um, before those crises and, and, and now and hopefully not in the future, so that, that's what we think we should call for, is this pro-cyclical investment. And I think this is what to a very large extent, not only, but led us to where we are, um, basically saying, oh, there is a crisis and housing is important. And um, now we see young people uh, living in tents by the uni in the big cities. Oh, we should invest. And it's, it's, it's patchwork. It's uh, very, very rarely, um, we, we still see good housing policies, but in the majority of the countries, we very often see patchwork. So we see a little bit of investment, a little bit of funding, um, this program, that program. Uh, in the end of the day, we, we have our members who have also very often limited resources and, and they have to find their time to understand how do I access this funding. This funding is very different from that funding. Um, and this, this all led to there. But also, I think we have um, realized that it's maybe time to tame a little bit housing markets because what we have seen is uh, quite big deregulation. So basically lack of regulation in many places and saying, oh, we will just let the, the market fix things. And um, in many places we're seeing that it, just the opposite is happening. And then um, in addition to that, so yeah, if you have lower investment, if you have um, incomes that are stagnating, and then if you have prices that are skyrocketing, it's basically the formula for a very good crisis. And on top of that, we see new phenomena, um, which we were maybe not so much aware of. So uh, yesterday in the, in the workshop, the touristification of our cities. Um, in the night, we, I was speaking with one of the participants who is from Dublin, and, and Dublin is one of the cities of the capitals that is experiencing very, very, very serious uh, housing problems. 
and we were speaking about nightlife uh, in Thessaloniki, and then said, oh, yeah, and no, or in Vienna. And then I was like, oh, you have a high standard because you're comparing to Dublin, you know, and it's, that's a fun city to live in. I was like, yeah, but also young people very often cannot afford to go to the city. So they kind of start staying away from the city. And I was like, is this the, the, the Europe that we want to live in, that our people cannot really enjoy the city? So we have touristification, underinvestment, uh, speculation, big investors taking over our cities. Um, we have massive uh, vacant housing in, in, in many countries. Um, land is going from, from uh, public ownership to private ownership, and this is a very, very limited resource. And on top of that, yesterday we had a very, very big discussion on we need to renovate, we need to be green, we need to go for that. It needs to be just, there is no doubt about it, but also every, uh, our, our um, visit, uh, um, kind of, yeah, the, the person who was, uh, Georgos, who is from the university, who was showing us uh, one of the, at one of the study visits, he was very serious in saying, everything that we do, we should think about how that could lead to gentrification. So basically, anything that is too cool, we should not, he was saying, we were going to the real estate agencies and we were saying, stop advertising that as being so cool because being so cool immediately increases the prices. So I think we have quite a few big challenges, but it's, it's, a, it's a big mix, I think, of what led us here. Uh, the good side of it is that it's solvable if we want to. Oh, that's good. Exactly good news. Uh, so there is it. Uh, Sotiris, you are part of the award-winning investigative team Cities for Rent, and you have investigated exactly what we are talking right now. Which are the main outcomes of your research? Yeah, thanks. Hi, everyone. I actually live in the cool part of the city <laughs> in Athens, uh, so I can totally relate with that. Uh, so, yeah, we started this investigation in 2020. It's still on. We are trying to investigate all these kind of uh, big international investments coming from outside Europe mainly to our cities. Um, the investigation started with a cross-border team of around 25 uh, data and investigative journalists together with designers. And actually one of the biggest challenges of this investigation, at least for the Greek example, was accountability and transparency, access to data, actually. Uh, because as part of the research, each member of the team had to respond to some very basic questions like how many houses are owned by the state or are owned by, you know, um, owners and how many people um, rent the house they live in. In Athens, and I'm sure that this is the case throughout Greece, we don't have this kind of information available. Uh, it shows a very big gap when it comes to transparency and it shows how local governments are not really able to, you know, create good policies for the residents of, uh, of the cities. So, working with these talents, what we decided to do in uh, the Athens example was to look into a different kind of investment um, in housing, and I'm talking about housing, but also as a different, you know, as an alternative financial tool because the financi financialization of housing, which we discuss a lot about, uh, actually means the transformation of house from a very basic human need and a human right to a vehicle for investment. Uh, and in Athens and throughout Greece, this is happening through debt. Or at least that was the case that we investigated because we couldn't really read information about who are these big investors who come to Athens, Thessaloniki, you name it, and they buy big chunks of housing. Of course, there is anecdotal reporting about that, but clear evidence is not available, at least to journalists. Now, with the digitalization of uh, the cadastry, we might be able to access this information, but not as journalists. Uh, so, briefly, I want to mention some cases of uh, buying debt, this, um, these investors in debt, of course they are related to housing because uh, debt and housing are, you know, two sides of the same coin, at least in Greece. Uh, so, I don't know if you've heard of uh, these companies called, you know, uh, debt collector companies or servicers. They are the main real estate agents today in Greece because they are not only trying to service bad loans from debtors like families who 
in the 90s or early 2000s, they got a loan from the bank because that was the way for them to access housing and have some security for their families and their children, as it was discussed in the previous uh, panel, sorry. Um, and because banks wouldn't really uh, service these loans, and of course because of unemployment, because of the huge financial crisis in Greece, people were not able to pay back their debt. So it was an agreement somehow between the European Union together with local governments and banks throughout the European Union that they had to have you know, a ratio of bad loans or non-performing loans, as we call them, of less than 10%. Of course, during the big crisis of Greece, this percentage was around 50 in Greece, which means one in two loans in Greece wasn't paid back. We are talking about a huge phenomenon that leads to uh, foreclosures and then auctions of houses. And in Athens, we identified the main actors who are these companies. Uh, they are international, very big companies that have established local branches in Greece and they buy very cheaply these loans from the banks. And of course, at some point, they buy through, who, uh, um, through companies within their networks, they buy the actual houses. So this is what we are trying to investigate. Still, it's been three years on. Uh, the international team uh, is still trying to find out how this very, very complex system works. Um, especially, we have a coalition of uh, media partners in the southern part of Europe. So we are working a lot with IRP Media in Italy. People from Italy, you might know them already. We are working with people from Portugal, um, Spain, and also we have our coordinators in Germany because they take over of the data visualizations that we produce as well. Um, on top of this investigation, this, uh, this network is still working on issues like um, housing for young people and micro-living. We are looking into land uh, usage, uh, how, as you said, uh, land is being transferred from the state or the public to private investors. And it's really, it's really challenging and I hope that we will be able to uncover these deep levels of corruption sometimes because of course there are companies connected to Ireland that, where we know that it's a very tax friendly uh, country to transfer and offshore actually these loans from Greece to companies there so that their incomes are not taxed the way they would be taxed in Greece. I'll stop here. <laughs> Hannah Smith, you are the Young Housing Councillor, and you've been a member at Star Block, right? So it's an initiative that actually brings refugees and locals together and trying to provide affordable housing for, for all of them. Could you tell us a few things about your experience and this policy? Of course I can. Um, in Amsterdam also we faced a housing crisis. It's very uh, hard for the youngsters to find affordable housing, but also for refugees that are new in the country, uh, they're placed in asylum seeker centers and they have to wait very long to find an affordable house. What we then see was that they wanted to make some complex in Amsterdam and Startblok Rikkehave was the first one. The Startblok in translating, it's like the beginning, your start, your uh, springboard, you're going to somewhere. And Rika Hafe is the, the region where it was. Uh, so we now already have some different kind of co complex with the same name. And what they tried to do was combine those two groups, the younger youngsters from Amsterdam or other parts of the Netherlands, combining with refugees that already have a status to stay for a longer period of time in uh, Amsterdam or in the Netherlands. And they want to combine those groups so you can also learn of, of each other. So maybe one of the Dutch residents will help and learn and teach uh, a refugee some about the language and also about the Dutch culture and help them um, making and finding their own way in the Netherlands. But also we learned a lot from the refugees so they can learn to us about their culture, what they have been through. And the thing what the program was about is that uh, the houses were really small. They're also, the houses were also not in the good condition. In the beginning it was a bit better, but after a while of living there, there also uh, happened some uh, problems, uh, some problems with the roof. Also, there was a big fire in November last year. Uh, but 
what connected the group always together was that they are still living next to each other. So they also made a system that every time there was one door, there was the refugee living, then the youngster from the Netherlands, and then again a refugee a youngster as well. Um, they also tried the body system, so they connect the youngers, youngsters, but you can also see that also without a body system, uh, people find each other and they are neighbors and they can just come to each other for a small question, but also have a very big involvement during the process, like what do you do, what do you want to learn, How and what are the needs you, you have. And I think one of the biggest things we learn is that uh, we also started there and that's complex with a self-management team. So the residents that were living there, both of the groups, were also doing the management themselves. So you had somebody that was giving the advice and also making the contracts of the rental, but you also had the communication worker and also when I, I did also my part on the self-management team, I um, uh, was um, contributed on the social um, team. And what we did was uh, combining the groups, but also facing all the challenges. Um, definitely during COVID, people were in their small uh, rooms. They had mentally problem, mental problems. Um, sometimes people had noise disturbance. Um, and also that definition of the word noise disturbance is also cultural divided. So also you have to talk about that problem and also find solutions for that. And that the self-management team on the complex, so that were your own neighbors working together, was also helping the social cohesion on that project. And it was really amazing to see. All right, perfect. So we're glad to have with us Nicola uh, Stefanuta. He's a member of the European Parliament for Greens. In Romania, hello, can you hear us, Nicola? Yes. I can very well. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you for being here. Uh, could you? Thank you for having me. Thank you. So, uh, could you, I mean, tell us, uh, it's affordable housing was one of the major problems. How you, you see it from your point of view and the, pro the, the solutions you might be proposed here? Certainly. So first of all, let me say hi to all in the room. You are young, energetic people. I'm glad there's also people from Romania. Uh, I'm so damn proud to be able to say that the Green family is also represented in Romania. You know, for me, it's such a, such a big, potent stimulus. Uh, and to be able to represent young people and people who know that there is an urgency to have political representation of young, progressive, green uh, Romanians. Now, also would like to, to thank Mihalis Guldiv and the uh, Heinrich Girl Foundation for their wonderful invitation. I should have been present with you, but the problem is I have to run. I have to run in politics. So people from my country will elect me. So. I'm stuck in Bucharest doing campaigning and talking to people. So please, please, please excuse me for not being physically present. Now, let's speak about the, the, the matter of fact. I came uh, on the, you know, on the transport here. I, I was reading a book by Bernie Sanders, who is one of my inspirations politically, and who speaks about a different solution uh, to the housing crisis. And actually, in Romania, it is a bit like everywhere else in Europe, but perhaps even more acute. I think Greece is among the countries with the highest rate of people not being able to move from their parents. I think if you're, if I'm not mistaken, Greece is number one or number two in Europe with the highest age in which young people can move from their parents. Uh, in Romania, I know we are top five, I think, in Europe with the same problem uh, with uh, boys or men being able to move from their parents after the age of or around the age of 30 and girls or women are uh, moving around the age of 26 27. Um, of course I, you will excuse me by using uh, just these two uh, genders etc I don't mean uh, to go into the identity uh, issue, which I respect very much, too. I just wanted to give some statistics uh, uh, about it. Thank you for the hearts. It's very appreciated. Uh, now, I saw it, so it's good. So, 
the solutions, the solutions. I was at the Green um, Social Summit in uh, Madrid and I listened to all the speakers and I listened to different solutions and it seems like we have to provide a several, several solution package. Not one single solution is a solution that fixes everything. In Romania, we are promoting several solutions such as more social housing, more social housing. Uh, there is a problem that there's very few social, uh, social apartments, social living, and there's a politicization for them. So uh, friends of the mayor, friends of the political parties get these apartments. And that's completely unfair, completely not okay for young people. So we have to democratize the social housing construction and distribution, and it should be targeted towards young people. I really think social housing should be targeted towards uh, young people. Secondly, rent control. Rent control uh, sometimes is popular, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But for me, the reality of the matter remains that there are cities in the world that have social housing and in which the measure works. Even large cities such as, uh, you know, like uh, large metropolises and, uh, and, and so on, where they have neighborhoods in which they kept, they kept the level of the rent. It is for me unadmissible that a city such as Cluj in Romania, the lowest possible rent you can get is around 400 euros for a garçonier, as they call it, as a one-bedroom apartment. Uh, you know, Romania is not a rich country. To have a lowest uh, rent for 400-something uh, euros is very significant for young people. It's not It's not affordable. It's, it's crazy, basically. Thirdly, we need to regulate platforms and uh, stop a bit the, the advance of housing being used only on Airbnb, being speculated for for uh, tourist purposes, etc. Uh, now, you in Greece know this problem very well. Uh, the Spanish people know the problem very well. Many other cities, also in Romania, it's a problem, you know, that entire companies buy up apartments and they put them up on, on a, a platform uh, and therefore they restrict the offer on the market and uh, people don't find apartments, cheap apartments or, or affordable apartments. So it's a really, really, really big issue. Is this a green issue? You bet. I think it is a green issue and we should leave it just to the to the uh, socialist or the left. Uh, I think social justice and justice in general is an important, important key message of the green political family. Uh, I want to, to pitch for another pro project that I'm working on. Uh, and that I, I lead in the European Parliament. It's called Erasmus Equality, and it's been uh, taken over by the entire by the entire Green family. So it's uh, going to be signature collection and testimonials in all all of the member states where there's Green politicians. Uh, now let me tell you something about Erasmus Equality because it's linked to the issue of housing. It's not only Erasmus has become such a low scholarship in terms of uh, money. That, that people get, that only kids from rich families can now go into an Erasmus. And I know that I'm right when I mention this. I know it because Erasmus to the network did a survey over the summer. And indeed, the level of the scholarship, 500, 600 euros, is not sufficient for people to live. So that has two effects. For instance, in Romania, if people, young people want to sign up for an Erasmus and they go to the university uh, you know, to the management. The management sometimes says, uh, well, do you have money from your parents? Because if not, you can't afford to go on an Erasmus. That is not okay. That is a shame. That is a shame for the standard-bearing program of the European Union. Erasmus is a success story. Is the success story so much in shatters? No, I want the answer to be no. So I'm fighting to get the Erasmus scholarships at least at the level of about a thousand euro per scholarship, because that's the real price of living 
with 10%, 20% inflation that we had last year, the cost of living is much more than what Erasmus can offer right now. And I cannot, I cannot, I will not accept a situation of differentiation between rich kids and not rich kids. For me, it's a scandal, it's unacceptable. So please, you know, because we have young people in the room, uh, please support the scholarship, the Erasmus uh, Equality Program. Uh, it also con contributes to the issue of, of uh, cost of living. And it's not only an Eastern European problem. There are, I know Christina, who's a German student in Bucharest. And she told me she's receiving 450 euros because Romania is supposedly a, a, a poorer country. So, But Bucharest is a very expensive city. She can barely make ends meet. She spends about 75% of her money on rent. Then she pays electricity. And she also wants to perhaps go out uh, or, or eat or eat just basic necessities. I'm not talking about going to a club. I'm talking about eating. So for Erasmus, my message is eating is not optional. Living is not optional. You need to increase the scholarship right now. So once again, thank you, thank you for inviting me to this, this panel. I'm honored. I am, I am going to fight for these topics. Uh, I invite everyone who feels green to join me in the battle next year. It's going to be damn hard to get some political results because it's, the competition is very hard. We started already a, a progressive green coalition, but we are open. We are open. To everyone who wants to join forces, we need to be strong. We need to be strong. We need to produce results. So I want everyone to, to, to have this thinking in terms of producing results in order to produce social, environmental, and generational change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So let's do what we've done in the previous panel discussion. Grab your phones and let's answer one more question. And it will be, I live. So with your parents in your own apartment, with a couple of friends in a dorm, or any others? So all the ma striking majority of young people being here in the room, they're living with their parents, and this underlines uh, how, how difficult it is to be able to rent a house and pay the bills for it. So I'm, I'm directly opening the, the floor to you to, to, to ask whatever you, you actually think about. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. We have the lady with a purple blouse. She was the first. So thank you everyone for being here. It's, it's really a privilege to be able to um, connect with you on this level. Um, and I, I actually have like multiple things I want to say, but I will say just one thing. It's mainly a question. Uh, when we're talking about housing, it's really important for me that we also include public space, because it's something that we are taxed on, it's something that we experience as young people, going to university, going to work, um, living in a house with a lot of roommates, or with our parents, we are forced, forced. we're choosing to um, occupy public space more than any other generation. Um, and that's not really including, included in any like housing um, projects. Uh, so my question is, how uh, could we um, involve public spaces in policy writing and how can we make it safer to be outside, um, like connected to the safe housing, affordable housing, while also like being, because, I'm sorry, I will put it in a sentence and then ask it. So, <laughs> uh, 
a lot of issues, especially with young people, is that they are living in apartments in uh, areas that are not considered very safe. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if we take that into account, uh, really the cost is, uh, is astronomical. Like you're risking your life, your sanity, your mental health uh, to live in an apartment that you can afford with one, two, ten other people. That, that's really my question. How can we um, engage with that policy and make it part of the housing issue? If I look from the Amsterdam uh, part of... Um, what, what I noticed is, is that in Amsterdam, every new building that's built for youngsters the, the, the houses are very small. There are small studios or places you have to share. And what, the, what they do is they also try to involve a lot of common areas. So they make common spaces where you can meet each other, maybe you can do your laundry together, but also eat and cook and um, watch movies together. And I think it's very good. And what we see is that we have a lot of those places in Young Sir's Complex. And every time we see it's a good example, we go with that example to the municipality and talk, talk with them about it, because we think in every youngster complex we need something like that. But also there are challenges. And the challenges are as well that you have common spaces and who's going to use it? Is it still safe? Because if the door is open, everybody can enter. That's good because then everybody feels welcome as well. But also uh, some people that are maybe not from the complex will also enter. So. Every time uh, when we have these common areas, we have to find a balance between the challenges and also the opportunities. We talk a lot about it with the municipality. In Amsterdam, we tried some projects. Uh, one of them is the project Uplift. Uh, I was um, one of the facilitators of that. And every time we brought a group of youngsters, we came to the municipality or also to the housing association and talked with them about what, what are the needs of the youngsters and how we will uh, balance out the challenges and opportunities. So talk with each other, talk with the municipality, I think, as well. And also maybe learn from other countries like us, so we can also give you the examples we already had and also the challenges and what we did about it. And one of the best examples, maybe it's good to talk, is that at Starblock Lee Karhafe, we were having a lot of green and it was um, is amazing, it still is there. And also what funny thing was to see is that after a while, uh, one of the organizations that were part of the local housing use complex, um, they gave, a, gave us a small budget and the budget was like, build or do of make something out of it. And one of my friends, he thought, I want a tree house. And he saw a tree, of course, uh, he went to the tree he went to a, a building store and built the wood, and he built a tree house. Um, he built a tree house, it was freaking amazing. I have pictures for the ones who want to see afterwards. Um, but after the tree house, he also wanted a swimming pool, a jacuzzi, he also wanted a little small castle, he wanted a small church. And we built it all from wood. And what we saw with also with the refugees that are not was, were able to talk in Dutch or in English, when we had that place, they just came over reading a book. Uh, they're just sitting around, also helping each other. And it was so good for an example that it was a low-key event where everybody was able to join, the same as sports. You can just grab a football and you can play. And the only thing with this playground was that it was amazing, but the municipality and also the housing association were afraid it was not safe enough. So everything is destroyed later on. But a funny fact I always will say, and I think they're not so happy that I'm t telling to you guys, but on that same complex, there was one storm. Everything we built was still standing over there. But the roofs of the houses of a two, t two complex <laughs> run away. They just, also out there I have pictures and videos about, but they were, just, they were just leaving. And then also we were just saying to them like, what we built is maybe not the safest because we didn't have the, the correct permit because it's it's long way to get it. It's also very expensive to get the permit. But we made it and it was there and people enjoyed it and they were a real community. And after that it destroyed, there was still a place we can make a fire and sit together, but also the community left for quite a bit. So I think it's also a good example about sometimes just do something what's not about legal directly, but also 
see how it's working and then maybe on other parts we can do the same and then on a legal base. I think first we can take these questions together. Let's see. There with the white shirt and the lady with the black shirt. Yeah. So thank you so much for being here. My question will be like, uh, like as we grapple with the, uh, like with the pressing issue of like housing affordability, like especially for young uh, people, uh, like. Uh, like the spotlight is like mostly turns to like a policy makers in navigating this uh, challenge. My question will be like, what specific recommendation would you like uh, propose for policy makers, both at the level of like a national level or EU um, level to foster a more uh, accessible, accessible and affordable housing market for younger generation? First of all, I want to thank the people that were part of this workshop yesterday because it was you guys were really amazing and I think we uh, made a really breakthrough with all the things that we discussed. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, I think for many of us it was not a surprise, but I think we didn't realize the gravity of this problem, of the housing problem. Um, and hearing all the stories from yesterday, I think it, it clicked for us that, wow, this is so much more than, than we expected. Um, and we also talked about that this is, in my opinion, it's not a topic that you hear very often. Um, it's not a topic that is, you know, in the spotlight. Um, what do you suggest, or when we go back home, how could we sort of communicate this, uh, sort of push this through to maybe the people from our communities, maybe the people, if you live in a dorm, how can you um, inform the, your colleagues, your friends, and so on? Um, so on, on, on the policy side, um, quite a few things. So the first one is uh, what I mentioned kind of before, let's not make investment in affordable and social housing a one-off, only when there is a crisis. Because crises, they, they come and go. Sometimes they don't go for a while. So and when we look at the very um, durable, I know somebody said that they didn't like the word resilient, but resilient uh, housing systems. When we look at the, the good examples in Europe, when we look at uh, Austria, at Finland, at Denmark, this is continuous, continuous, continuous investment, which is not linked to a political party or my views against your views. Of course, they're different, but this is really one uh, part of the, the solution. Then land, it's a limited resource. We see cities, for instance, such as Barcelona, huge housing problem, but they cannot even extend the city, they cannot expand the city because the city is just limited by nature. So there is the mountain, there is the sea. So make sure that the land stays public, because once you sell it off, then you don't know what happens with it. Um, try to tame uh, the market. See what, what uh, we, we heard for cities for rent. Who owns those places? Who, wants, who has the interest of buying 200 apartments all at once? What are they going to do that? On the public spaces, super important um, topic. And we know that so public spaces, they need to be well distributed. We need to make sure that if you look, I come back to Brussels, but that's where I live. Um, in Brussels, when you look at where the parks are situated, it's still quite of a green city, but the poorer areas, they don't have quick access to parks. It's, it's in the wealthy neighborhoods where the forest is, where this is, and then that is. Um, so we need to make sure also the gentrifying problem. We need to be really... Uh, we need to make this kind of topic very mainstream because it's still not very well known of what happens. And um, I, don't, I don't do advocacy myself. I, I do the communications of housing gear. But when my colleagues, uh, when they go and meet policymakers and they say, well, that renovation wave that you want to make happen, let alone that it can be very expensive, but it can totally push people away because uh, in places where tenant regulation is not very strong, somebody would just have the right to, you know, increase uh, rents dramatically. Um, in places where we don't have um, 
a good threshold of social and affordable housing. Make sure that you have good tenant rights, that you cannot be evicted from one day to the other, because that gives you a sense of stability and that you can, that you can uh, be living there, that even if you're renting, you still should be able to feel at home. Um, during COVID, the access to green spaces, the access to air was like huge. Uh, and then we had an architect in one of our conferences, he was saying, Building a home with a balcony is one of the cheapest infrastructures that you can build. So we need standards for that. We need standards for how you build so that it, it's really quality homes that... Um, I'm also Bulgarian, so in, in Bulgaria now we have, uh, we'll have national elections. There is a whole campaign of how we do renovation of the renovation every three years. Where does this money go? Simplify funds. I think simplify funding, uh, it's, it's, it's just... Um, incredibly important. In one hand, I understand the EU that they want to hold um, beneficiaries accountable, that you make sure that money invested into that doesn't just go into somebody's pockets. I totally get that. But we still need to make sure that people who, they're busy with many other things, the community building, you name it, um, they, they, they can actually focus on what they're doing and, and, and then just channel those money. Uh, and maybe a final thing, but we saw skyrocketing construction prices also um, in, in the past few years. Um, and we know, for instance, there was a big boost in terms of recovery plans coming from the European Commission. So once COVID happened, they said, oh, we should build back better in a way, kind of the US thing. But we, we have this 750 billion euro, we give it to countries and then they decide um, what percentage of, of this uh, budgets we can invest in, in different uh, streams. And then we tracked what goes where into social housing, affordable housing, energy poverty, social communities, homelessness. Um, so what happened in many countries, and it's now happening, we still don't have the good picture of it. But for instance, in Germany, due to uh, very big construction prices, we hear about stalled projects. So they made one planning, calculating that this will, how much, you know, my insulation costs. All of a sudden, it's 50% more. Um, Portugal, the same thing. So we need to be really, really mindful on the investment uh, side. And uh, there, is, there is a lot, but it's... Um, and final on, this, on the spaces, now there is a nature restoration law, um, which is being discussed at, at EU level on how we can uh, make sure that we bring greenery back and this will be also one of the big discussions how we make sure that green first we we strike a balance between the need for more housing and and the green uh, spaces but also that green spaces don't mean that you know just one part of the society has access to to green parks parks yeah. and uh, really final only on the how you can um, how we can do that on how we can spread the words um this came for for a few years, we've been running at Housing Europe together with each time with different partners, what we call a, an international social housing festival. It's a pity that Michalis is not here in the room now because he started it in Amsterdam with international students saying, um, we, this is amazing, like the Dutch system has a lot of problems, but still one of three homes is social housing. How, how come you have that? Let's celebrate, let's have a party every day on the street about that. Um, we didn't have a, street, uh, a party every day on the street, but we started back in 2017 with uh, the International Social Housing Festival, so bringing those topics to different cities, celebrating what works, but also being quite critical. Um, and then since then we've traveled to yeah, Amsterdam, then Lyon, then Helsinki. Uh, this year it was in Barcelona and we had the biggest festival of over 2,000 people. Uh, and cities start realizing now they want to own the city. You wonder to what extent they want to own it because it's a good political campaigning. But sometimes we, we just need to, to make those projects being heard uh, more widely. Sorry if that was a long answer. <laughs> but it's a great idea. Hannah, well, just a brief uh, remark, if I can have for Sotiris, about spreading the word. I mean, did, did you have problems actually, uh, you know, publicizing your research and take it to, to the media? Do the media actually have a grasp of how important this problem is? In Greece, no. Like, we come from this very uh, independent, non-profit, uh, audience-driven kind of publication. Of course, we we are really alone, and it's not that just we are alone. Like I know that you know the case, but our team in Greece is also, you know, the one that has been 
uh, publishing about the Predator files, like the, the spyware scandal. And I, I mentioned that because we have a huge lawsuit against us. So this way I want to highlight how um, we cannot access as journalists big media outlets because they don't really care. First and second of all, uh, the media landscape in Greece is really owned by uh, huge businessmen that are involved also in politics, are involved in uh, sports uh, and everything. One comment, one brief comment I wanted to make about how to uh, reach more people and how to actually um, get more information because this is our tool for us. Like, And I can really advocate about data-driven decisions in journalism and data-driven pieces would be to uh, ask for more transparency from uh, the the authorities that have this data. Like, they should open this data for us because we need to keep people accountable because it's what you were referring to. Like, we need to know who is buying and what they are doing with, this, um, with these properties because of high levels of speculation as well. People, you know, these investors buying uh, big numbers of apartments and then they either keep, keep them vacant for a long period until they create the right circumstances in the market themselves always to sell them back in higher prices. Uh, so I would say starting from the grassroots level together with the communities that we report on as journalists and with the communities that we report with uh, more importantly is to uh, really push back for more transparency and more accountability on the authority side of things. I think you're making an interesting point about the housing system in the Netherlands. It's also very... We have a lot of houses that are on the social system, but also the social system is not cheap. It's now around 808 euros and 6 cents. That's the cap. And we have a pointing system, and if you fill in the pointing system, you can directly see how much a landlord can ask for a room. But the problem is, if he's filling in the point system and he's just asking any other price, there are no consequences on this moment. So what you see is that a lot of landlords ask for very high amounts of money, even 800 euros is a much, but they also try to do it very higher and even higher than they are normally able to do. And what the problem is that so many people and so many youngsters as well in Amsterdam do not, do not know their rights. So they don't know that there are systems, there are procedures to follow to get your money back. So. After I lived at Rikerhaven, I was starting to work as a law teacher at the University of Applied Science in Amsterdam, but also I started working for a foundation, Stichting Woon, and it's giving free legal advice, also to youngsters, um, about their tenants' laws. And what we see is that we now go to complex, we talk uh, with the residents, and we tell them what their rights are and how they can collect their rights. We're starting a lot of procedures and one, when the group wins and they get their money back, then they also tell their friends about it. And that's how we want to uh, make this a successful si uh, system, is that when you start one procedure, it's leading to another, it's leading to way more. And then all, that's also a way how we uh, continue doing this whole procedure to making it more affordable in Amsterdam but that they don't know their rights. I'm really frustrating about that. So I'm talking a lot of, of, I'm giving a lot of lectures also at universities about this problem. Like not just sit in your chair, not just only um, are angry about that you're paying, paying too much, but also do something about it. And that's also something we talk about with policymakers. So otherwise they are only making policy, but the youngsters who are living in the houses, they know what they face and they know what kind of rights and needs they are having. And they do not not always know that they have those rights and they can make policy and they can change it. Thank you. We have one question there with a black t-shirt, yes. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Emil from Germany and I have a, an example of, um, of yeah, uh, one of the solutions to a housing crisis. Um, which is centered around people owning the places they live in. I think similar to what you were part of, um, Hannah, if I understood you correctly. Yeah. yeah, okay, maybe you can explain it. So basically the idea is that the people um, own the apartment complexes and so on that they live in, and then together 
um, take care of them. There's more communal spaces, there's less private spaces, and so on. And I think that's one of the most sustainable ways to address this topic, because it's sustainable in an economic sense. There's no one taking money out of there, because it's all rather reinvested. It's ecologically sustainable, because you share more spaces. And it's socially uh, sustainable, because then you can also make sure that rents don't go up as much. Um, now, of course, there's a huge lobby on the other side that is really not interested in, uh, in housing and property being taken off the market. Um, so what, do, what are your positions on this and maybe also your experiences? Do you know of any regulation that favors this kind of um, development? And I'm not sure, is Nicolas still there in the online space? But if he... No. Ah, okay. Then that's fine. Then maybe just to the three of you, um, if you know of any examples specifically to regulation that enables this kind of development so that the people can actually um, make sure that they get or are, are in charge and can self-organize around their housing. In Amsterdam, the organization Foundation Woon I'm working for, we have three colleagues now on daily basis working on this topic, the housing um, cooperatives. Um, we have, I think now, a couple of them in Amsterdam. Um, some of them already started, some people already live in uh, the cooperations, uh, cooperatives, uh, and some of them are now in the uh, part that they are discussing. And one of the biggest problems in Amsterdam is, is finding a place where you can start it. The municipality is on board on this point in Amsterdam, so that's great. But also it's something that takes a while, like uh, the financing, uh, where, how, uh, find the people who uh, want to do this. And I did a project in Amsterdam, uh, that Uplift project, um, and we also started a group of youngsters to do this. But the, the, the reason now in Amsterdam it's not so um, fast on working is what we see is that if you are young, maybe now I need a home and not in four years. So this type of uh, projects we see now will take way too long for youngsters and definitely now on this point for students because if they are now want to make a cooperative, uh, they start and when they are almost finishing their study, they can live in it and then it's already too late. But yeah, in Amsterdam and the municipality is really on board now, so we hope the foundation will be on board. <laughs> um, and then we hope in Amsterdam we will have more of these uh, options because yeah, I'm also believing in that it's one of the bi biggest solutions now. Of course, yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think for instance on the city of Barcelona, uh, when they realized that they were in big trouble with housing, now they have managed to secure for instance that. Um, very often when a home is, is, is for sale, if, if the city wants to buy it, then they're the first one to be able to bid. Uh, in this way, they manage to acquire um, quite uh, a few homes and then turn them into, into, into co-ops. Um, also, uh, vacant housing. It's, it's starting to, to be really a, a burning issue, but we have had uh, examples within the public cooperative and social housing sector. Uh, where it was uh, vacant homes were then maintained or renovated by, by public cooperative social housing actors. And I think a model which <clears throat> it's not often getting the, I would say, the, the, the attention that it deserves is uh, social rental agencies. They work mostly with the private market, but then, uh, with the private market, but then uh, if you're a private um, landlord and you want to rent your, your place, you work with them and then they ensure that the rent is kind of fair for the standard of living uh, of the city. And uh, they take care of all the renting, all the um, network kind of relation between uh, the landlord and, and the renter uh, so that it's not damaged. But they also make sure to, if there is um, a price that they need to cover to make it to the market price, then it's the social rental agency that covers it. Um, so there are very different um, tools um, yeah, I, you mentioned that you're from Germany. Germany is a quite specific case with referendums, privatizing. It's a complex issue that me as a comms person, I would not get into, um, right? <laughs> but, um, but a tricky point there from what I've heard is that you also need to be careful because 
some private actors, when you want to, when there is a push to, to make this public again, is because there is a gain behind it, because then they will sell it to the state on a very high price. So obviously also the state is, is, is careful and cautious of that. So um, yeah, it's big money and big interests, and you always have to be careful with housing and real estate. Thank you. I agree very much with Emil's point about having democratic control, although I'm thinking it should go further that there should be a legal requirement to uh, act that, say, a company that owns lots of houses, that they must have democrat be democratically controlled by their customers. Although I'm thinking on the point that had been raised about the like getting the Erasmus scholarships the up. I'm thinking the considering inflation is something that happens all the time. It seems like something that the, could be put into uh, the responsibility of, say, uh, an EU commissioner to the, where they can lead, say, consultations to establish the cost of living in the in EU countries to find a, so that they can actually find an appropriate price for the scholarships that they could perhaps increase every year. So it would mean that the European Parliament could focus on other on other issues rather than always having to discuss raising the like the scholarship as well as being better for the people who are on Erasmus so that it doesn't fall behind. Yeah. Can you maybe take one more? Yeah. Hello. Uh, actually, I wanted uh, to speak specifically to Sotiris. Um, because he's from Greece and I'm from Greece as well. And we all know that uh, houses are not affordable for uh, young people especially, taking account, of course, the minimum salary that we can uh, have. So can we hope to a much cheaper, let's say, and more affordable rent in uh, the near future? And how is this possible to be done? Because those companies have uh, those... Um, uh, houses that bought uh, because of the rent couldn't be paid off. And also, what are the cities if we uh, want to go abroad? Because I think it's the only way for me, uh, especially. What are the cities that we can search on that provide safety, uh, decent condition, and also a better way of life? I, I I rather have bad news when it comes to rents. Sorry for this. I, I, I really don't see how a, a market that is not regulated at all or cities that are uh, focusing on how to attract more uh, tourists or, um, you know, uh, how, they, how they build the foundations of the touristification and gentrification of the center uh, will help tenants find cheaper rents. I, I really don't see how without uh, a real change in policy, rents will become affordable for people. At the same time, and I don't really want to advocate for this, but it has been happening to, Greece, to Greeks as well since the pandemic that, you know, we, we work from home now and there might be more possibilities for work from home. International work, I mean. Uh, this, this could help a little bit, I guess, but um, I don't really have good news as far as I know when it comes to decreasing rent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like my rent was increased by 25% this year. Uh, Nicola, there has been one question raised about regulation uh, and one from, uh, from uh, for Erasmus and the possibilities that we have to make it affordable again. Yes. So uh, I heard the plan that was uh, that came from the room, and it's a good plan. I just have a, a little problem, um, and I tell you what: I've been fighting for Erasmus equality since 2019, since when I became a, a member. Initially, 
they said, uh, oh, it's not possible because uh, if, do you want fewer scholarships? Is that what you're saying? Uh, uh, because the same money divided uh, by uh, higher scholarships means fewer scholarships. And I said to them, no, I want more dignified scholarships. I want uh, scholarships that are sufficient, that are enough for people that don't turn young people into into beggars or privileged classes. Uh, that was the first one. Now, when the inflation came, uh, some increase was done. And by the way, I'm very proud to say that when I was the rapporteur for the budget, I managed to increase the scholarship by 67 euros. It might not be a lot, but I'm happy, you know, to to have fought for it. And this year, I introduced amendments for another 33. So in total, like through parliamentary amendments, I increased Erasmus by 100 uh, euros per person. It might not be a lot, but that's what I manage with my tools. Now, coming back, I think there's a problem in calculating inflation because the young people, uh, if they use the index, as you suggested, of, inf of inflation, uh, they will, it will be tricky because young people are more affected by inflation than the general population. Why? Because young people consume basic services. They consume rents, they consume food. They consume drinks, they consume transportation. And all of these have been much more affected by inflation than other sectors which are included in the term inflation. Because young people don't consume financial services uh, and I don't know what. So that means, you see what I mean? The, the inflation ratio is smaller than the reality for young people. I, I hope in the room I was able to express what I meant to say. So the basket of things comprised in the word inflation contains more things uh, that are outside of the reach of young people. Definitely. Which means it makes it lower, it makes it look lower. So you have to take into consideration real inflation and real prices for real people, for young people. Can we also raise the question about regulation? Do you think that the regulation at the European level when it comes to housing would bring results? Yes, for sure. For sure. Because, because. so in two weeks, uh, the Green Political Family would ha will have its position on, uh, on housing and we will also have the, the, rent, the rent file. I forget what the entire name is. Um, it's a legislative file that I think is... It's supposed to be over in a, in a few weeks. Regulation at the European level helps. It helps a lot um, for the housing for the housing issue. Uh, I'm trying to think because a lot a lot of these issues are local policies. No, it's the city government that, that decides if you have. Uh, but setting minimum standards, setting minimum standards, and acting, for instance, on social platforms, social and economic platforms such as uh, Airbnb or others, I think is what Europe can do. Setting some minimum standards uh, for, for instance, the necessity to, to have social housing or the necessity to have affordable rent or things like that. I think it's what Europe can and should do. Thank you. Let's open the floor for more questions. We had yeah, one there already. She's waiting. Thank you so much for the very hands-on examples uh, you're representing on the panel. Um, and I think what I found most inspiring is that we really need a revolution of how we understand housing. I think that housing is also... Um, something that we can understand as a social a thing, but also as um, Hannah um, pointed out that it's also something that is tackling also other issues, like it's an intersectional issue, and I think we need to understand that too, um, because then we can have more large scale solutions. So my question is, I'm coming from Munich, and that's the worst, worst um, example, I would say, how cities um, gentrify, uh, gentrifies, how cities um, also don't uh, leave spaces for young people. 
So I wanted to ask Diana if um, you would say there are cities that actually understood that, that we need to rethink housing in a way that we need intergenerational housing, we need housing where we meet each other and then foster change through that too. And um, to Sotiris, if you also have examples um, where we actually successfully could lobby for more accountability and transparency, um, not on a voluntary basis, but how do we keep those who are actually in power accountable? And maybe for Nico too, um, if there are also um, solutions on the EU level for that. Thank you. So housing is usually in the power of national governments. At European level, because Housing Europe operates at EU level, we can say that this is often taken as an excuse and sometimes it's the other way around. Um, at, at national level, there is plenty that can be done and th those are the things that I already mentioned. So it's also at, at national governments, so invest, be mindful of the green transition, don't gentrify, um, take care of the homeless, which work with people on the ground, work with, the, with, with those who are mission-led housing providers who really would not uh, expect the benefit, work with young people. Um, ensure that fundings, our funding is not so complex. It's, it's, it's all, of, all of the same. But also at EU level, um, depending on who you talk to, but uh, so we've had very good example from, from the Green Party. Uh, we had a, 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 an MEP from the Netherlands who had an own initiated report, uh, affordable and decent housing for all. She made a, a huge progress um, during this mandate in bringing, having it adopted by, by her colleagues and, and moving things forward, opening all of the big elephants that we've been discussing today. So we have seen progress. Um, um, we had in, the, in this renovation wave that the European Commission mentioned, we had uh, the European Bauhaus Initiative, which we, where we totally recognized our sector. They were saying, oh, this should be um, sustainable and beautiful and we should live together um, and more kind of exchanges of policies and examples. Um, so there, there, is, there is good and bad, but I think um, overall we need to, to really insist. And if this is the last thing that I, I, would, I could ask you today is you're very bright people from what I've seen and um, I'm sure that you stand out of the crowd very often, but when you go back home and because you have those new tools and new ideas and new ways of communicating and, and do it however you'd like, but make sure that what I find very difficult in, in my communications work, because that's in the end of the day what I do, is to cross the line between the culture wars, between, between the council culture, between calling somebody what we were talking today <clears throat> about just wokeism or you're just cancelled, you're out. So test different approaches so that we manage to cross those borderlines because the more that we are expanding, uh, kind of uh, getting away from each other, I think the more that the housing issue will just not come across and not only, but uh, this is just one example. Mm -hmm. um, for giving an answer to your question, I thought about some new legislations we have in the Netherlands. What is maybe a good example about how to focus on uh, what's the problem and how to solve it and also have accountable the persons that are involved with it. Um, we have a new law and translated it, it's a law about being a good, uh, a good landlord. That's also definitely the translation of the law. The wet goed verhuurderschap. And what we see is that in that law, we def make a definition about when you are the perfect landlord or the perfect, you are a good, well, even, even not that maybe. But what we did in that, we, we made a definition about if a landlord does this, then you're a bad landlord. And then we had a lot of examples. And including with that law, we made um, some registrations parts in every municipality of Amsterdam, for every municipality of the Netherlands. So every time you are young, you are uh, living in a dorm and your landlord is doing shitty things, you now can go to that register uh, place and then register what they did and then it's also going to the municipality and also going to the politics. And it's a very new law, it started in July, but also in that, in that way we wanted to um, sort of naming and shaming also the landlord what, what are, that are making the problem and that are, that are doing something wrong in this whole system. 
so they are going to be having um, faced with their uh, problems, the things they do wrong, and also we hope that the, the youngsters will uh, collect all their negativity energy, put it in the, the right spot, so also then the uh, local uh, municipality, the landlord, but also the politics can make uh, even more legislations and policies about this problem and how to solve it. I think that's in briefly so some example in the Netherlands we're working on right now. Um, oh yeah, and I think one other example is that what we are now also doing in Amsterdam is that when they are building a new complex, you have uh, some percentage um, specialized or it's like social housing, middle housing and expensive. So that's a 20, 20, 40, uh, 40, 40, 20 uh, legislations. But also we do that for specific groups. So we now see that um, there are no longer enough uh, primary school teachers and secondary school teachers in Amsterdam. There are not enough policemen, agencies as well, uh, policemen working in Amsterdam. They're, because they're not affordable, they cannot afford living in Amsterdam, so they move out. And then they also find their jobs outside of Amsterdam. And one of the things the municipality did was the new legislation, the new policy about the, how many percentage of the houses that uh, are free needs to go to the, the, those specific groups. And also that is something that if we see that it's not happening, then we can also have a new reason to talk with the municipality about, yeah, you made some rules, but is it also working? And also then we can talk with the groups uh, about, okay, we don't see so many new policemen come to the city center and get those houses and live there again. What's the reason? Have the debate and also find new solutions. Thank you. And very briefly, for a good example of our investigation and a win uh, in this rather challenging work, uh, comes from the Czech Republic and my colleague Gabi Kazalova, she works for uh, Denik Referendum. And what she did as part of our project, first of all, was of course to um, talk with residents that have been harassed by uh, corporate landlords and big investment companies or they were living in neglected houses. The second thing she did, which was the big win for her, um, was that she managed to get information from the cadastry in order to find out who the people behind these big investments are and pinpoint these properties on the map. So when, the, when her reports came out, of course these landlords and these companies were not happy, so they should her. Uh, and um, she didn't do anything illegal, of course, right? Maybe, you know, scraping inf information from, from the cadastry is not the best thing to do when it comes to confronting um, big landlords, but it was the plan for the investigation and everybody was in for this from our team. And actually, a couple of weeks ago, ago she won the court case against the landlord. So we have examples of big wins from our side. They are a few, but we need to celebrate them, I guess. Nico, could we have from you the closing yes. remarks? I, I just want to, to add one thing. So I don't have an, uh, a genius solution coming from the EU because of all the limitations. However, I want to say one thing. I think the EU system in which the EU intervenes only if it's about competition or trans-border issues or an economic issue is a bit broken, is broken because people have expectations from the EU that go much beyond that system. People have expectations on health, people have expectations on housing, people have expectations on social affairs. So, you know, treaty change and all this, I can give you that kind of talk, but I know how hard it is. And the quicker solution is to vote politicians who think like this. You cannot vote the extreme right or I don't know what, and then expect the EU to do something because the EU, it's the politicians that you send Brussels and the politicians that you put in government in the council. That's what the EU is. The EU is not the commission. It's also the legislative 
branch, which is made of council and parliament. So if you want quick solutions or, or solutions that are linked to what you are saying in the room from the EU, then you need to send the right politicians to the EU. So you need to get involved, you need to campaign, you need to elect people who speak your language. It's as simple as that. I know it sounds maybe political, and of course a politician would say something like that, but that's the reality, you know? You cannot just be uh, independent or, or say something like, uh, I'm going to be in an NGO and not touch politics, and then to expect an answer from politics. That doesn't work. You cannot have the cake and eat it too. Uh, that's the reality. So if you want fair housing, elect people who have solutions for fair housing. Because the secret in the EU is that there's always some sort of leeway, you know, there's always some sort of article that can be used better or more smartly. That's why we have a EU policy on health, you know, we don't have a competence on health, we cheated. But with the pandemic, we needed a competence in health, so we invented one, basically. So, if you send politicians who think like you, you might have a chance to have also European answers. The rest, uh, if I, you know, if you want me to give you some standard answer, I don't have one more than what was said already. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for being so present, asking questions. Hope we had a very elaborative discussion here and we raised new issues about it and hope we'll have the courage to bring back to our homes all these points we raised here and fight for a better future. Thank you, guys. Thank you.